welcome. My name is Arik Burkowski, and I manage the Russia and Eurasia program here at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Uh, we're delighted to have you join us for our conversation today with two esteemed political scientists uh, and colleagues, Maria Shevel and, uh, I'm sorry, Oksana Shevel and Maria Popova. They will present uh, their new book, Russia and Ukraine, Entangled Histories, Diverging States, uh, which delves into the root causes of Russia's war against Ukraine. The book was published only three weeks ago, so it is still hot off the press. And for those of you who are on campus, you're welcome to purchase the book at the Tufts University Bookstore, uh, which is also supporting this event. Despite the winter storm outside and the campus closure, we're delighted to be joined by students, scholars, and members of the public from near and far. In fact, that's a silver lining. We get to uh, have uh, those of you who are not in Boston join us. And please note that we are being recorded. It's my honor to introduce our two distinguished guest speakers and moderate the event. Oksana Shevel is an Associate Professor of Comparative Politics at the Department of Political Science and Director of the International Relations Program at Tufts University. Her research and teaching focus on the post-Soviet region, especially Ukraine and Russia, and issues such as nation building and identity politics, citizenship policies, memory politics, church-state relations, and the democratization process in the post-Soviet region. Maria Popova is an associate professor of political science at McGill University and a scientific director of the Jean Monnet Center Montreal. Her work explores the rule of law and democracy in Eastern Europe. Her recent scholarship has focused on judicial and anti-corruption reform in post-Maidan Ukraine, the politics of anti-corruption campaigns in Eastern Europe, conspiracies and illiberalism. Aksana and Maria will give a short presentation about the book, uh, roughly 45 minutes. Uh, I may then ask them a couple of questions and then we will invite questions from the audience. So Aksana and Maria, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, thanks for inviting us. Uh, I'm going to share the screen and then we will start. Um, let's see. Okay. Is it working? Yes. Yeah, okay. So I guess I'll start and uh, let's see if we can do the uh, slide uh, changing uh, smoothly. We've, uh, this is the second time we're doing it with these slides. So, um, so I'll start by laying out uh, the main argument that we try to make in this book. And uh, what we set out to do is to, to explain sort of why did we uh, see uh, this confrontation between uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, the full scale, and why did Russia invade and why did uh, Ukraine resist so vigorously? Um, and we go back uh, quite a bit in history, but the focus of this argument is really the last 30 years of post-Soviet political development between the two states. And we argue that what is at work is an escalatory cycle between uh, Ukraine's commitment to its independence uh, after 91 and Russia's commitment to re-imperializing the area and re-establishing control over Ukraine. And it's an escalatory cycle because the two processes are, are connected. The more Ukraine commits to its independence, the more uh, uh, Russia tries to find ways uh, to push for re-imperialization, but the more um, Russia pushes for this re-imperialization, the more Ukraine commits uh, further to its independence. So this cycle gradually produces really growing and very significant uh, divergence on a variety of um, dimensions. Uh, it produces divergence in terms of um, self-conceived identity. Ukraine commits more and more to a distinctive uh, Ukrainian identity, whereas Russia commits stronger to an imperial supranational civilization identity. Um, 
also the escalatory cycle leads to a gradual but more and more stark regime uh, type divergence as Ukraine moves from a competitive authoritarian regime to a democracy, uh, then uh, to uh, trying to strengthen and um, and solidify this democratic regime, whereas uh, Russia uh, slides gradually back into authoritarianism and then and then really consolidates a highly repressive authoritarian regime. And, and the third dimension that uh, people tend to be most familiar with, but we argue is is sort of the effect of the other two divergences uh, rather than a driving force is the geopolitical orientation divergence. And um, uh, in which uh, Ukraine increasingly starts looking westward and starts um, trying to integrate into the Euro-Atlantic community and uh, Russia increasingly sort of turning away from cooperation with the West and becoming um, anti-Western gradually. Uh, but the the gist of the argument of the book is that it is the domestic divergence that really uh, drives this process and uh, the geopolitical divergence really follows uh, rather than precipitates it. Yes, so we're now going to uh, briefly go over this, um, some evidence that we use in the book of how this um, divergence and how this escalatory cycle uh, works in these different issue areas. So I'm going to start uh, with uh, the politics of identity. As Maria already mentioned, our story really starts in 1991, kind of even before, maybe 1990 or so forth, um, with the um, very different um, understanding on the part of Ukrainian and Russian elites, what was the Soviet collapse ultimately about? Right, uh, uh, Ukrainian president, first president uh, Kravchuk, famously called um, "collapse of the Soviet Union," uh, civilized divorce. Uh, but really, um, among the Russian political class, it was understood more kind of potential for some sort of rewriting of vows. Like, yes, Soviet Union was going to collapse after um, Gorbachev, uh, anti-Gorbachev coup fails, and uh, in Ukraine, uh, a declaration of independence is passed by the parliament and then ratified but in the referendum in December 1991. It's sort of very clear that Ukraine is not going to stay in some form of renewed union then. But it doesn't mean that there was no sort of aspiration or expectation of hope on the part of the Russian political class. And that includes, uh, you know, liberals in the Yeltsin camp as well, that in some way, shape or form, this was sort of more like kind of like misunderstanding. And in one way or the other, there would be close and drawing together. Um, on the part of Russia and Ukraine in some sort of form of closer political, geopolitical cooperation. The form of it was to be decided, but that was kind of what the different expectations were around the collapse of the Soviet Union. And again, there is historical research on that. This is not kind of our finding. Um, you know, Sergei Plochy, for example, written a book on the last four years, four months of the Soviet Union, where he really goes into, especially in this Russian elite perception, how um, this uh, collapse of the Soviet Union was not really what they wanted. Yes, it was inevitable at the time, but it wasn't really the end um, of you know, political, uh, some form of political cooperation or union, um, ultimately. Uh, now, in Ukraine, that's a very different story. What we, what we talk about uh, for the 1990s, um, that in Ukraine, something that we call the grand bargain uh, exit formed in, at the elite level. The term itself is Andrew Wilson's. He talked about it in one of his uh, earlier books. And what it basically refers to, it refers to the convergence of interests on the part of Ukrainian sort of national democratic right. These are the people, this is Ruch, these are the people who, who uh, were ideologically committed to Ukrainian sovereignty and independence, uh, who were repressed for this in the Soviet period. They win about 25% of the legislative seats in the 1990 elections. So they are present, but they're not by themselves sufficient to kind of bring this agenda to life. Um, but then what happens that the Ukrainian communist majority in the parliament essentially splits and a part of the former communist elite, and that includes both of the first two presidents of Ukraine, Kravchuk and Kuchma, decide kind of for pragmatic reasons that they want to also jump on this bandwagon of sovereignty. Power of Moscow is waning, power of the communist party is waning, and really the way to keep control and sort of stay in power and be their own boss is now in this framework of sovereign Ukraine. So there is this convergence of interest in this form of this grand bargain between the so-called center and the right. Um, 
even though for quite different reasons, more sort of ideological commitment on the part of the right and more kind of pragmatic calculus on the part of the center. But the end result is still that then, you know, once this commitment is made, then the whole sets of policies underscoring distinctiveness of Ukrainian nation, which in turn legitimizes independent Ukrainian state are being adopted. These are policies such as Ukrainian is the only state language. Again, it's really more about symbolism of a separate state having its own language as opposed to making everybody speak Ukrainian. It's the policy of single citizenship that, you know, Ukraine, again, is not going to have some sort of enmeshed dual citizenship with Russia or CIS, which is what Russia wanted in the 90s. It is going to have its own kind of symbol, again, of statehood is uh, citizenship policy. Uh, also rethinking, rewriting, kind of reconceptualizing uh, teaching of history. Instead of this grand historical narrative, which was there in the Tsarist and in the Soviet period, that Ukraine and Russia are destined to be together, they were always together, kind of, you know, common aspirations, common goals. There is now emphasis on the different points in history when there was actually contest and contestation, when attempts uh, of Ukrainian agenda political to establish some sort of greater control were crushed by the Russian Empire and, you know, the Bolsheviks and so forth. So this is, you know, also this process goes in Ukraine. So none of this is welcome developments in Russia. So in Russia, there is its own domestic politics of identity unfolding. There are different kind of ways of imagining, quote unquote, the Russian nation. Most of them are in different ways we can say irredentist because the nation is imagined as transcending the borders of the Russian state, be it Russian speaking nation, Eastern Slavic nation, kind of equating Russian, true Russian nation with the Soviet citizenry. There is an option to define the Russian nation by the boundaries of the Russian state, sort of the civic Rosiskaya nation, for a variety of reasons, you know, even Yeltsin originally is on board with this. There is really a lot of pushback against it, the so-called red-brown coalition, the opposition. Yeltsin is facing domestically from the nationalists and communists in the parliament who are very upset about the collapse of the Soviet Union. And sort of gradually, not immediately, but kind of gradually, this notion that Russia is really some kind of larger civilization slash, um, you know, supranation that exceeds the borders of the Russian state and does include Ukraine. Uh, at least most of Ukraine, with the possible exception of more westernmost Galician region, is really becoming kind of the majority view. And that, that's, and again, the policies that Ukraine is pursuing to separate itself um, this have, on identity dimension is really resisted um, by Russia. But because um, in Russia, sort of one can say, well, okay, if they always sort of resisted this, why didn't they do something about it sooner? Well, you know, for a variety of reasons, very importantly, because first of all, there was a degree of political competition in Russia not everybody, you know, there were, there were some sm smaller but still present, you know, liberal camp that did not necessarily ascribe to it. There was also political competition, kind of disagreement about methods. Some talk about having like Russia as quote unquote liberal empire that would become successful functioning market economy and democracy would become attractive to the former successor states of the Soviet Union this way. They would be sort of organically drawn to it. And then, of course, there is state weakness and war in Chechnya and all sort of these other things that are distracting. Um, attention. So, sort of, this is kind of the elite story, this divergence in identity politics in the 1990s. The public, uh, you know, the attitudes, um, public opinion story is also interesting because we could say that in Ukraine originally, this um, kind of um, divergence away from Russia is really more of an elite project. The public is more divided. You know, you're all probably familiar with this map, uh, you know, kind of Eastern, Southern Ukraine uh, in one color and Western, Central Ukraine in a different color, meaning kind of stronger pro Russian attitudes in the South and the East and stronger kind of pro Western or quote unquote anti Russian attitudes in the, in the West. So that is, you know, broadly speaking, true, but there is much more nuance. It is much more interesting and complex story than there being these two sort of firmly bounded camps. Public opinion was changing, and but the change was not in the direction that would favor kind of closer integration with Russia. So originally, especially with the economic collapse of the 1990s, despite this 92% in favor of independence on the referendum, then there is kind of, you know, saying that, okay, things maybe didn't work out, certainly not economically, maybe some sort of closer... Uh, cooperation with Russia, um, you know, is the way to go. But then, so gradually, on a variety of issues, and this process really starts in the geographic center of the country, and it wouldn't be until after Euromaidan, and especially after the full-scale invasion, when really attitudes in the south and the east would change quite dramatically. But there is this kind of evolving attitude towards support for Ukrainian separateness, for Ukrainian distinct identity, you know, education matters, having the flag matters, having the state matters, people kind of begin to accept this new reality. And we see that this map, for example, illustrates how the vote for parties that declared more clearly pro-Western orientation 
yes, they were not winning, but they were getting larger and larger percent of the seats, right? So if Chernobyl in 91, on the wins in Galicia, by 98, Ruch wins kind of like the parts that were in the interwar Poland, you know, broadly. Then we have, you know, our Ukraine Yushchenko party vote by 2002, you know, reaching that line there. And then by 2004, it shifts yet, yet more. So we have this... Um, you know, the process is, again, at the societal level, slower, but still moving not in the direction Russia wants. And on the elite level, really decisive move in the direction, again, Russia doesn't like and tries to push unsuccessfully through the 1990s to change. And then there are several critical junctures, with two in particular that we talk about in the book. So the first one is the Orange Revolution. Maria is going to talk about, about it, and then we'll, oops, um, we'll pick up. Maria, let me know when to switch to the second half. Yeah. Of the yeah. So, uh, so the Orange Revolution is a critical juncture uh, in terms of Ukraine's and Russia's regime uh, development. And it's a critical juncture because it really is quite highly contingent and it could have turned out uh, differently uh, very easily. Um, you know, we we go through some uh, counterfactuals uh, where, for example, um, if Yushchenko had died from the dioxin poisoning, uh, it was unlikely that he would be replaced uh, by a another candidate in the uh, Ukrainianization pro-Western camp who could uh, win. So we may have ended up in Ukraine with a Yanukovych presidency as early as 2004 and um, autocratization. And, and then this divergence that was growing between Russia and Ukraine could have been bridged in this moment uh, with a pro-Russian uh, autocratic leaning president uh, who might have um, had an easier time or will have had an easier time uh, cooperating uh, with Russia, increasing integration and sort of bridging uh, this initial divergence. So it's a critical juncture because uh, it is also the moment through the success of the Orange Revolution, which was a, um, a mobilization uh, in um in reaction to manipulated elections, it's the moment in which uh, Russia's, I mean, uh, Ukraine's uh, political regime goes from a competitive authoritarian regime that has a measure of political competition, but the playing field is uneven. Uh, the different actors are trying to sort of muscle each other out from the political competition playing field to a uh, democracy in which basic things like uh, free elections, uh, no media um, censorship, um, freedom of assembly become entrenched and become sort of, uh, there's a precedent for Ukrainian society that these are going to be uh, significant, that these are now uh, features of uh, the Ukrainian political regime. So, so Ukraine becomes sort of a democracy at that point, still very dysfunctional because uh, the coalition doesn't last very long. Uh, they have uh, several early elections because government is falling apart, uh, but uh, and, and corruption and uh, rule of law issues are are still there and and seriously uh, sort of um, hampering uh, liberal democracy. But it is very much a jump towards uh, liberal democracy in Ukraine's case. Uh, we see uh, that after his uh, his win in 2004, uh, a lot of uh, things change in Ukraine that that spur this divergence, move the divergence away from Russia uh, in a very clear direction. Yushchenko pursues Ukrainianization policies um, that have to do with uh, memory politics about the whole Domor, uh, about World War II, um, starts a sort of church uh, distancing uh, type of policies in terms of um, foreign affair, foreign uh, policy orientation. He very much um, is sort of the the first to start a very purposeful uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, agenda. He starts uh, from his inauguration uh, by emphasizing uh, that uh, Ukraine is a European nation belonging to the European family of nations. He has this 
uh, idea in the in the start that Ukraine is going to um, implement all of these policies, democratize, uh, democratizing reforms very quickly. And uh, he imagines that Ukraine, by the end of his term, may be entering uh, the EU. Uh, none of this happens. The EU very much uh, throws cold water on his enthusiasm. And um, and this doesn't really uh, work, but it is an era in which uh, a lot of reforms are uh, adopted with a view towards uh, European democratization and European integration. On the Russian side, on the other hand, um, the Orange Revolution is a critical juncture because it creates um, this anxiety uh, in the Putin regime uh, that um, that uh, this potential for a color revolution uh, threatens his increasingly uh, autocrat uh, autocrat is, um, his increasing autocratization. Uh, so he interprets 2004 in Ukraine uh, not at all as a development that's caused by Ukrainian uh, political, domestic political dynamics, but as a Western plot against uh, Russia. He interprets this not as uh, Ukraine diverging for its own reasons, but Ukraine being lured away, stolen uh, from Russia. And that increases the commitment to re-imperialization, the commitment to try to get Ukraine back somehow. Um, it also triggers all sorts of uh, reforms within uh, Russia as he tries to sort of protest proof the Russian regime to avoid um, a, a color revolution happening in Russia. Uh, the uh, youth movement, uh, for example, that tries to mirror uh, the civil society organizing that took place uh, in the uh, around the Orange Revolution, uh, this is a co-opted uh, youth movement in um, in Russia that seeks to actually strengthen uh, the regime's hold on power. This is the period also in which, um, as an um, illustration of this uh, of what we argue is this increased commitment uh, to uh, re-imperialization, we have the emergence of the Russian World Project uh, and the idea. Uh, that Russia needs to actively work towards binding these um, countries in the region back uh, to itself uh, through purposeful policies. And, and, and so uh, one of the, we deal here in this critical juncture moment with uh, a lot of uh, different counterfactuals or a couple of counterfactuals. The first one I already um, uh, talked about this, this idea that Ukraine may have uh, in fact, missed uh, this democ democratizing uh, opportunity. If uh, Yushchenko had died and uh, Yunukovych had won the election, uh, but the other possible counterfactual is that uh, you know it, it it comes earlier in uh, in that period, but is relevant to the critical juncture. If someone else had been in power uh, then, rather than Putin, if. Uh, political competition actually survived in Russia post uh, Yeltsin, uh, we may have seen a different reaction uh, to the Orange Revolution, um, not this sort of paranoid uh, perception uh, that Ukraine is being stolen uh, away. It may have had debate on, on how, um, you know, even if even if Russia was going to attempt uh, to try to bring uh, Ukraine back into the fold, what would be uh, the best method to do that? So at, at that point, it's really um, a critical juncture for Russia as well, uh, moving into uh, increased uh, autocratization under uh, under Putin, uh, which may potentially have been uh, different. That's not what happened, though. Um, we saw the autocratization um, under Putin's uh, second term at that point unfold uh, quite quickly. Yeah, and just to illustrate, we had we had just a few slides. So here, for example, um, the, this attitudes of Ukrainians uh, to the uh, characterization of the 1932-33 famine, the very mention of which in the Soviet period was basically a criminal offense. And by the end of the Yushchenko period, we see the majority of the population is now in agreement with what you know has become a law under Yushchenko tenure. 
that uh, the, the Holodomor was genocide of the Ukrainian people. In Russia, of course, the narrative has been that it's quote unquote common tragedy of Soviet people, right? and it was nothing sort of specifically anti Ukrainian uh, about it. So again, sort of this, these shifts are gradual. If we were to dissect it by region, we would see that it's really the center of Ukraine, geographic center, where these attitudes begin to evolve. So kind of the West was already sort of, we can say, in that category um, in the 90s. And then the East and the South would not really catch up and, you know, until after 2014. But, you know, the geographic center is moving and becoming kind of more similar to the West as opposed to more similar to the East. So again, the trajectory is not there in the direction that, you know, that uh, Putin would like to see. And there is also this divergence on identity, on regime dynamics. Maria, maybe you want to say a couple of words on yeah, that? Yeah, it really shows that, uh, illustrates nicely, this is uh, VDEM data, it illustrates nicely that the uh, post Orange Revolution period is um, a the Orange Revolution is the critical juncture where the regime trajectories of Russia and Ukraine really change and they uh, never cross uh, paths again. That divergence is never bridged, uh, but it's the biggest opening that happens in uh, the post Orange uh, Revolution um, era. We see here. Uh, on, on various, uh, however you want to, uh, or however it's measured, whether it's as electoral democracy um, or um, as um, sort of the freedom of the uh, press and, and, and free flow of information or engaged society, freedom of assembly, civil society, we see that all of these sort of, uh, uh, in all of these dimensions of uh, regime dynamics, uh, a gap opens up between uh, Russia and Ukraine, and um, it is never bridged. So, so then, sort of the, the, the way the story continues in our book, then there is another, you know, possibility again when uh, this the, this escalatory cycle maybe could have been undone, and that was the Yanukovych presidency. So, when Yanukovych gets elected in two thousand ten, after uh, you know failing uh, to to win in the elections in two thousand four. He very quickly moves Ukraine both in the regime dimension and in the identity dimension in the direction that Russia favors. So on the um, regime dimension, there is growing autocratization. He, of course, got, gets elected under the parliamentary constitution with, with more limited presidential powers. That was the outcome of the Orange Revolution. One of the outcomes, he very quickly uh, basically uh, muscles a majority um, in the parliament, uh, imprisons Timoshenko, stacks constitutional court, um, and the court... Uh, then rules out that this 2004 reform was unconstitutional and reverts Ukraine back to the strongly presidential system, giving Yanukovych increased powers. On the both foreign policy and identity politics dimension, also various legislation is passed during Yanukovych tenure that moves kind of in the direction Russia wants to see. There are these infamous Kharkiv Accords extending the lease of the Russian Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. There is the 2012 language law that gives Russian the status of official language in about half of Ukraine's uh, oblast, which again kind of both reduces the incentive to learn Ukrainian and again kind of serves this function of like blurring the boundaries between the two. There is a talk about having dual citizenship, apparently even some work began on the Russian side to draft this law on common citizenship with Ukraine, right? And then, of course, in, in you know, in Russia itself, Putin returns to presidency, launches um, even more of, of autocratic consolidation. Um, it's trying to, you know, drag Ukraine into this Eurasian economic union, so, and then, of course, things come to a heel during Euromaidan, because once Yanukovych at the 11th hour, after receiving a $15 billion bribe from Putin, actually decides to renege on the signing of the association agreement. And it's important to also keep in mind that kind of a prequel to it is Russia starting a trade war against Ukraine in the summer, leading up to this, so really making it sure. So at that point, NATO is nowhere near, you know, on the agenda. So Russia is really not liking the fact that Ukraine integrating, trying to integrate economically um, uh, with the EU. So in any way, so once Yanukovych, um, the, once Yanukovych um, decides not to pursue the EU association agreement, um, that spurs uh, Euromaidan protests. And here we kind of have another this critical juncture that had Yan Euromaidan turned out differently, right? Had Yanukovych was able to crush Euromaidan, um, had he stayed in power, as opposed to being ousted, maybe that was another sort of last, probably last chance to reverse this divergence between Russia and Ukraine, because Yanukovych again would have aligned Ukraine closer to Russia, both on the regime dimension and on the identity dimension. It probably wouldn't have been easy, especially on the identity dimension, 
well, ultimately we would never know, but at least, you know, that was the hypothetical possibility that again, this escalatory cycle and this divergence uh, could have been avoided um, or revert, reverted, right? But of course, that's not what happens, right? Euromaidan um, ends up um, in the ouster of Yanukovych. There are, just for the sake of time, we won't go too much into it, but I mean, of course, there are different accounts, the way Russia presents Euromaidan as some sort of far-right coup and or Western conspiracy. But that was another kind of misperception, so seeing Ukraine through this imperial lens when really denying Ukrainian society, the agency that it did have, of course, Euromaidan was a domestic political process. And then when Yanukovych regime collapses, it's not because the far right somehow like outs him or something like that. It's basically his own regime crumbles. So this uh, mass uh, killing of protesters um, in the downtown Kyiv is really the last straw that leads his regime to crumble. So that's also important to note that it wasn't the case that, you know, some Sotnia from Maidan or any other group like he literally ousts him, his regime collapses, he flees, and then the parliament is facing this kind of completely constitutionally unprecedented situation when the sitting president disappeared, right? So he self-removes himself from office. So it is really not anti-constitutional, but sort of extra-constitutional situation. And then there is constitutional majority of members of parliament that basically vote to exactly that same because Yanukovych self-removed himself from office. They are going to have new elections, appoint interim president um, and all of this. And of course, in Russia, this is, you know, this whole uh, sort of spin um, develops and continues to this day how it was uh, some sort of an illegal coup and um, a far-right conspiracy funded by Western money. So this, um, now, so after Yanukovych uh, is ousted and um, Ukraine enters the post-Euro-Maidan era, we, we are yet at another cycle of divergence. And sort of this is brings us closer to the full-scale invasion because at this point, um, Putin throws uh, in the towel in, in the sense that he annexes Crimea. Um, and then also helps and sort of sustains uh, and amplifies this um, insurgency in, in Eastern Donbass. And that has profound consequences in Ukraine, because of course it is done to kind of, you know, keep Ukraine in the fold, because, you know, Yanukovych fell, and how do you keep Ukraine, um, you know, closer, so sort of the message escalate. But of course the results backfire, because now in Ukraine, the most pro-Russian electorate is ex essentially excluded from participation in the electoral process. So if we add Crimea and Eastern Donbass, where Ukrainian uh, state lost control and say elections to Ukrainian um, le legislature were not held in these areas, that's about 12% of the most pro-Russian electorate. So as a result, we have political parties that are more committed to this kind of pro-Western Ukrainization uh, and, and Ukrainization agenda now win majorities that they never had in the parliament before. So communists are completely wiped out and this grand bargain no longer is in place. Instead, kind of more pro-Western, pro-Ukrainian agenda is much more easily adopted. This is when we have adoption of laws such as decommunization law, a new language law and all of this. So again, sort of the, uh, the process of divergence, um, divergence escalates. And um, on the Russian side, um, I think, do you want to talk about maybe the, um, yeah, I think sure. it's your um, I'll, I'll add that also uh, 2014 to 22 period sees uh, increasing uh, divergence between Russia and Ukraine in terms of uh, regime type. Um, after uh, Euromaidan succeeds, Ukraine does eventually sign the association agreement uh, with the EU, and this association agreement is the first um, association agreement that the EU signs with uh, a state that's not officially a candidate, but has a conditionality component to it. And this conditionality, uh, as we know from the broader literature on, on uh, EU's role in democratization in the post-communist region, um, the the carrot of uh, EU uh, membership um, creates this uh, process in which uh, civil society uh, can push democratizing reforms uh, by by constantly bringing up the possibility of. Um, of uh, increasing, increasingly moving towards EU membership, and so uh, regime the uh, incumbent government it, uh, adopts a lot of uh, democratizing reforms in the areas of uh, rule of law and anti-corruption that set the institutional uh, architecture in place to start to tackle these uh, problems with uh, the EU's. Um, help and 
uh, and uh, through uh, EU conditionality, Ukraine becomes more integrated economically into the EU market, tries to integrate politically. Um, so, so the divergence is growing. Um, at the same time, in this uh, period, um, Putin still sees uh, the West as weak and uh, sort of permissive insofar as the West is reluctant to actually help Ukraine uh, very, uh, in very meaningful ways to try um, to um, recapture Crimea or anything like that. That's not even at all on the agenda. Uh, the West institutes uh, some uh, sanctions against Russia, but basically uh, it has accepted uh, Russia's land grab um, it doesn't, uh, the West doesn't help in any specific meaningful way uh, uh, Ukraine to recapture um, Eastern uh, Donbass either. Uh, the West is very um, sort of careful and permissive uh, with Russia's policy in Syria uh, and basically allows uh, Russia to prop up Assad. Um, so uh, the message that that sends um, to uh, Putin is that if necessary uh, to impose uh, control over Ukraine through military means, it's there as a possibility. He also has a very permissive environment uh, at home, domestically permissive in the sense that while the the Russian population is not demanding uh, a re-imperialization of uh, Ukraine and, and is not asking for a full-scale invasion, the Krim Nash uh, um, sort of boost in popularity signals uh, to Putin that this is a... Um, that grabbing more of Ukraine uh, could only win him some points, uh, is unlikely to hurt him politically. He also... Uh, through this boost in popularity, pursues further uh, autocratic consolidation. There's uh, constitutional reform. Uh, there is increased pressure on on uh, the Russian opposition. Of course, we know that's when uh, Navalny is poisoned. Um, so, um, so really, uh, Putin has doesn't have a lot of constraints. Uh, domestically that would prevent him either domestically or from the West that would prevent him from uh, from achieving Russia's goals of establishing control over Ukraine through military means. I mean, he tries um, uh, to uh, to do it through Minsk um, and uh, maybe through friendly uh, pro-Russian oligarchs such as uh, Medvedchuk. Uh, but as those... Um, avenues of control are gradually closed off. And, and here we mention that uh, uh, the Zelensky administration pursues uh, de-oligarchization measures, uh, which are very much threatening to uh, this uh, lever that Russia has over Ukraine. Uh, that's sort of a, a, a trigger that sends a message to Putin that maybe something radical he will have to radically escalate uh, the uh, the methods uh, through which uh, re-imperialization can be achieved. And uh, Oksana, I think, will briefly talk about the Minsk uh, method of establishing control. Yeah, I'll briefly talk about the Minsk, and then we'll talk about, if you're thinking there's a big elephant in the room, what about NATO, we will end with that. Yeah, but uh, so, the, so as Maria was saying, this, the dynamic here that we see, you know, uh, increasingly after 2014, that various levers of control that Putin has over Ukraine are all weakening, and some of them are weakening because of Putin's own actions, so essentially sort of this... Uh, pressure on Ukraine backfires in a way that, you know, this escalatory cycle um, uh, descriptor we think captures quite well. But the Minsk business is important because, again, there is this narrative um, certainly pushed on the Russian side that, uh, you know, Ukraine violated its obligations under Minsk and if only it, um, you know, fulfilled uh, its obligations, uh, everything would have been fine, war would have been avoided and, you know, uh, basically it's, it's all kind of Ukraine's fault for violating Minsk. But what really this narrative is missing, like what was really Minsk all about? What were the goals of Minsk and why did Minsk fail? And what we argue in the book that, again, and sort of it's a broader argument about um you know, Ukrainian territory, uh, or any particular Russian-speaking region, Southeast or Donbass specifically, that the war in Donbass was never really about Donbass. What it what really was, it was about controlling Ukraine entirely. 
And the strategy was Minsk, and that was, you know, Minsk was kind of shrunk version of what in the spring of 2014 Russia really hoped, was, was hoping to leverage this dissatisfaction in the um, much of the Southeast with the outcome of Euromaidan to essentially force so-called federalization on Ukraine, whereby the Southeast, either in whole in this form of so-called Navarrosia that, again, briefly they tried to create that project failed, and then once it's failed and only these two people's republics were established in parts of the Donbass, that this entity would be able to force so-called federalization of Ukraine. And then through the special status, which was mentioned in Minsk, but not defined, and sort of this vague conception of special status that was supposed to be agreed with the proxy representatives of Russia, representatives of these republics, would essentially push the Trump Donbass as a Trojan horse back in the Ukrainian political body, but with, with, with substantial power up to the ability to have a veto say over the content of Ukrainian domestic and foreign policy. So it was not just about some sort of greater linguistic or other rights to the Russian speakers in this territory. It was really leveraging Donbass as, a, as an entity um, to achieve veto power over Ukrainian domestic and foreign policy decisions. And that way, right, again, yes, in that sense, had the Minsk succeeded, invasion wouldn't be necessary because then basically Ukraine would have been vassalized through this, you know, implementation of the special status on terms favored by Russia. But that fails because Ukrainian political class understands very well what's it all about. So here we have to do this phenomenon that Zelensky elected in 2019, with the promise to bring an end you know, to, to the uh, war in Donbass. He talks about meeting in the middle, but once he actually takes office, and again, in Ukrainian society, there is also support for peaceful resolution of this, right? But once Zelensky takes office, he quickly realizes that this is what really Russia wants. It's not about some you know, specific details of how local police force would function or how Russian language could be used. It is really this so-called special status that you know, Russia would get to define because Minsk text, which was disadvantageous to Ukraine, said it had to be agreed in consultation with these entities, right? And then Ukraine essentially loses sovereignty. So neither Ukrainian political leadership nor Ukrainian society, because on the one hand they did want peaceful resolution, but then when people, you know, polls asked directly, do you support the special status? It was minority across the small minority across the board, because again, people realized what it's all about. So that's kind of the last straw. So when Minsk really fails, Putin, that's when he launches full-scale invasion, because again, other means of vassalizing Ukraine um, and having control over the ability of central Ukrainian government to pursue independent policies fail. Right. So that's why I think it's, it's important. So that's why we call it a tro Trojan force and emphasize in the book that the Donbass war was not really about Donbass ultimately. So just to kind of illustrate, you know, how these changes were happening, uh, you know, the trajectory that Ukraine uh, has been on. So here is the slide that shows changes in identity, you know, increasing number of Ukrainians. And again, we see kind of 2004 as a bump, 2014 as a bump. And then, of course, again, after the uh, full scale invasion, that Ukrainian identity, like identifying with the Ukrainian state becomes the dominant identity for majority of the Ukrainian uh, population. The same goes sort of this acceptance of uh, state nation building policies on language and so forth. So this is not really a shift necessarily in the use of language, but it is an acceptance of state one language policy and Ukrainians symbolically saying, yes, Ukrainian is my language. I may not speak it in every, you know, uh, every way uh, of my daily life. So that shift in linguistic practice actually comes much later and really is uh, particularly boosted with the full scale invasion. But um, symbolic kind of acceptance, you know, of Ukrainian identity, Ukrainian linguistic identity, state policies on that um, happens um, at that time. And then also really dramatic change um, in the preferences for various geopolitical alliances, especially NATO, right? And Maria is going to talk now about NATO because that's, again, we see the shift here in the opinion polls. Um, and the last thing we'll do is address this counter argument um, that really it was NATO invasion that um, led to war. Um, so I'm going to switch, I think, to the last slide here. Yeah. So, uh, so this is sort of the main alternative uh, explanation out there uh, that has quite a bit of uh, traction, maybe less so over time, but uh, certainly in the beginning. Um, and, and that's the, um, the idea that Russian aggression really was NATO's fault. And there's two versions really, and two elements uh, to this argument. Uh, the first one was that Russia perceived uh, NATO expansion uh, as a genuine security threat. And, and, and that's why it preemptively 
uh, had to uh, invade uh, Ukraine in order to prevent Ukraine from also uh, joining, and uh, mainly for the reason of bolstering its own security because it didn't want NATO to be on its borders. I mean, this... Um, this stronger version of the argument um, has been really unconvincing in the 2014-22 period for the reason that uh, Ukraine was nowhere near uh, NATO membership. It didn't receive any meaningful uh, invitation. It wasn't getting integrated in militarily. Uh, there is research that shows that the um, that the military cooperation, even in 14 to 22 between uh, Ukraine and NATO was actually very modest. Um, so it doesn't make sense for Russia to be genuinely concerned about this. But really, uh, the argument has absolutely been falsified by post-22 uh, events. And, and how has it been falsified? Well, we've seen uh, after 22 that uh, Finland and Sweden ask and receive NATO membership. Uh, well, Sweden is in the last stages of it, but uh, um, but Finland is already a member and Finland has a big border with Russia. And Russia not only doesn't actually try to prevent that, uh, but in fact pulls away its uh, military forces from uh, the uh, border with uh, NATO in order to devote them to trying to conquer non-NATO Ukraine. So it really falsifies this idea that Russia is actually genuinely concerned about NATO being at its borders, because in fact, it allows NATO to come much closer, to come at its borders in an increasing um, uh, way since 22, yet continues to focus on uh, capturing Ukraine. So, so this really shows that there is something about Ukraine here um, uh, that is driving uh, Russia's policy rather than uh, sort of uh, a pushback against NATO. The second version of this argument is um, it has more merit. It's, it's the argument uh, that uh, Russia perceived uh, NATO expansion as an encroachment on its sphere of influence. That not that it was um, concerned about uh, NATO attacking it, so not a security concern, but really a an imperialist uh, drive to continue controlling the uh, geopolitical orientation of its neighbors, and and that's why uh, the potential of uh, Ukraine's NATO membership, even though Ukraine wasn't really close to to achieving it. Uh, was uh, unacceptable uh, enough for Russia that it caused it to invade in 2014 and then uh, to go for the full-scale invasion in 22. Uh, the, the problem, the convincing part of this argument is that indeed uh, Russia does not want Ukraine to be in NATO. That is very clear. Uh, because it stifles its possibility, it, it would make it harder for Russia to control um, uh, Ukraine uh, politically as a vassal, clearly. However, uh, the point is, uh, uh, the difficulty that this argument um, runs into is that really uh, NATO, uh, Ukraine's geopolitical uh, orientation is um, and and the possibility of Ukraine joining NATO is neither necessary nor sufficient as a condition for both of these invasions. Uh, why? Because the timeline uh, doesn't really match. Uh, the invasions come at moments uh, that have a lot more to do with uh, where Ukraine was moving domestically than with uh, Ukraine's geopolitical orientation. Um, for example, the first invasion did not come in 2008 when uh, the Bucharest Memorandum uh, said, promises that at some point in the future, uh, Ukraine uh, will be a member of NATO and Yushchenko was, was very uh, uh, strongly pushing for it. It doesn't come then. Why? Because Russia, after all, does realize that this is a very vague promise uh, that uh, this was really uh, Bush's um, personal preference, uh, 
Uh, he was a lame duck president uh, about to finish his term. It's not even clear that he speaks for the U.S. foreign policy establishment, and it's very clear that other uh, members of NATO, France and Germany, are, are vehemently opposed to this idea. Um, in, in fact, as this uh, discussion uh, then happens around 2008, we have, for example, um, uh, Lushkov uh, uh, saying, well, uh, forget that the Ukrainians are trying uh, to enter NATO so hard. We actually have to, our biggest problem with them is that uh, they are uh, using the Russian language less and less and oppressing it. So we should invade them not for NATO, but for the Russian language. So, um, but in any case, there's no invasion then. So the point is, it doesn't map onto uh, the timeline of events um, uh, neatly at all. In 2014, Euromaidan has nothing to do uh, uh, with uh, with NATO. Um, if even if um, there is an expectation that a new Euromaidan government would be moving towards NATO, at that point, in the run up to 2013-14, there isn't a um, a majority of Ukrainians wanting to be in NATO. That comes after Russia's aggression. So it can't really be the cause of Russia's uh, aggression because it follows it. Um, and, and the same in 22, uh, there is really no meaningful steps that Ukraine had taken towards NATO membership that could be threatening uh, to, uh, to uh, Putin to make him think that uh, uh, Ukraine's NATO membership is imminent and that's why he has to prevent it. This wasn't happening in terms of uh, Ukraine being sort of de facto into NATO, or some people refer to this as not Ukraine in NATO, but NATO in Ukraine. That argument is also um, exaggerated. It doesn't actually correspond uh, to uh, what we, um, to the evidence. If you are interested, I would recommend reading uh, Alex Lanoshka uh, and a co-author whose uh, name I'm blanking on, a uh, recent article where they show that that really the 2014 to 22 Ukraine-NATO cooperation was very modest in terms of military buildup. Uh, this is not where, um, where the action was. If anything, uh, uh, if Russia really truly were concerned about a security threat from NATO, it would be more concerned about uh, the Eastern flank NATO member countries preparing, being sort of getting a message from 2014 that Russia is expansionist and sort of preparing to defend uh, better. This is when NATO does take steps within the NATO members already. Uh, but that's not what Russia reacts to, right? So so the idea here, and, and that's what we try to um, uh, make uh, the argument in the book, is that really controlling Ukraine's geopolitical uh, orientation is um, important to Russia, but it is only one of several ways in which Russia wants to control Ukraine. It is absolutely insufficient for Russia to only control the geopolitical uh, orientation of Ukraine. Uh, Russia wanted to control its domestic politics, its memory politics, ci citizenship politics, language politics, and those uh, problems would be there even if NATO had disbanded and disappeared. Um, so, so that's why uh, we can't actually buy the argument that NATO uh, is in any form a driver of this process. It's only one small piece of the puzzle. The much bigger um, uh, reason for the collision course between Russia and Ukraine is this increasing domestic identity and regime divergence that uh, creates in Russia this um, uh, this commitment to trying to bridge it and to end this divergence and to tie back uh, Ukraine uh, to itself. And so in other words, it goes way beyond uh, NATO. NATO is a small piece uh, of the puzzle. I think that's all we had, so I'm going to stop a screen share and we can take your questions. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Oksana and Maria, for the very eloquent and insightful presentation. And I hope that
encourages all of you to pick up the book and read it. Uh, so we can take questions in uh, two ways. You're welcome to raise your hand on Zoom and I will call on you and you can ask the question or you can type the question uh, in the chat. But perhaps I'll start with uh, one question and uh, that is perhaps uh, top of many people's uh, uh, minds after recently watching the, uh, the interview that uh, Putin gave to Tucker Carlson, which is that after Euromaidan, uh, Russia often depicted the Ukrainian government somehow as embracing the far right. And throughout much of the war, we've heard time and time again this Russian propaganda line that uh, Russia seeks to denazify Ukraine. Uh, though we know that ultranationalism uh, has hardly played uh, a role in Ukrainian domestic politics over the last decade, um, Petro Poroshenko's uh, electoral failure in 2019 in many ways showed the limits of using ethnic nationalism as a political strategy in Ukraine. So given the complex tapestry of ethnic, linguistic, religious, uh, regional identities within Ukraine itself, how these factors influence the balance between ethnic and civic nationalism in shaping the country's path toward Europe? And how is Ukraine's historical experience, which you very eloquently outlined, especially in relation to Russia, informed its current emphasis on civic nationalism in its pursuit of sovereignty and its identity? Shall I start? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So no, this is a great question, and uh, you know, you sort of in part answered it yourself. I mean, this uh, the, the um, relative significance or the prominence of the far right is greatly overblown in this Russian narrative, right? It's just not to say that there isn't, you know, a far-right component to Ukrainian political competition. That is not to say that it wasn't present in Euromaidan, but to, to suggest that this is kind of what is driving it, or, you know, the extreme version that the government itself is like some kind of Nazi cabal um, is it, just completely ridiculous, right? It's not only that the Poroshenko um, couldn't win the re-election with this army language face um, agenda, it's the far right decreases in prominence, right? Whatever few seats that they had, um, that they lose even those seats. If you look at the, at the local election out of something like 30,000 seats in the 2019 election, uh, it is like maybe two dozen, like out 18. of 30,000. Uh, 18, right, okay, less than two dozen, thank you. Uh, so, so you know, so that kind of narrative is just not, uh, not convincing. Now, the sort of civic ethnic dimension is more interesting because and this, I think, the, the issue, the kind of the problems or some challenges of describing the process through this theoretical lens goes kind of to the problems with the lens itself, right? Like what exactly is civic, what exactly is ethnic? On the extreme, maybe it's very clear, right? Like you say, okay, let's eliminate some ethnic minority group, like that's clearly ethnic, right? And like, let's kind of embrace democracy and constitutionalism, like that's clearly civic. But what, for example, if a state like which is the case in Ukraine, right? Is committed to one state language policy. Is this civic nationalism? Is this ethnic nationalism? It, oftentimes, for Eastern European countries, like that, they would be put in this kind of basket of ethnic nationalism, nationalizing state. But then look at France, like the prime example of civic, you know, nationalism in the literature. I mean, they have like very strong kind of language support policies. Like, why is sort of that policy is civic? But if, you know, a state like Ukraine or, or you know, Estonia and the other say, OK, we're going to have one state language, that's what makes them ethnic. So I think what we have in Ukraine is sort of this kind of growing complementarity between is there's certainly strength, strengthening civic nationalism, commitment to, you know, to Ukrainian state, to independence, to democracy, which is now like close to 90 percent in all regions. Say it's important to very important for them to Ukraine to be democracy. And I showed this slide this growth in the civic um, identification with the state, right, as a civic identity. But at the same time, there is also great em embrace of, say, Ukrainian language use, right, or commitment to, you know, Ukrainian should be the only state language. There is this kind of de-imperialization, uh, removing of, say, monuments to various Russian imperial figures and so forth. And I think we should be careful before we sort of quickly slap, like, ethnic nationalism label on this. Like, is this really ethnic nationalism, right, or is this de-imperialization? Like, you, you can call it kind of affirmative action maybe, right, um, against, say, historical memory that was suppressed during the Soviet period, right? So I think that's kind of, you know, partly answer to your question that I think these labels are obviously very widely used, but I think it's worth bearing in mind, like, what is really behind this label, right? And what are we labeling as civic as opposed to ethnic nationalism? And what does this complementarity, the scholarship acknowledges that it exists, like France, right? There is some complementarity, uh, you know, but, but I think it, it remains under-theorized. 
maybe I'll just add a very short uh, addendum here on the on on Putin's um, denazification uh, sort of line, um, and the fact that he uh, first it's uh, the denazification really is shorthand for de-Ukrainianization. So for this idea that. Uh, any version of a Ukrainian distinctive identity is anti-Russian by definition, and because it's anti-Russian, it's Nazi. Because being a Nazi, it means being someone who is fighting against Russia. So the fact that uh, Putin continues to uh, use the denazification line, even though it really has not caught on because of all of these uh, uh, problems with labeling um, a, 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 an administration that doesn't have the far right Nazi, the fact that he is holding on to it really signals that the goal here is de-Ukrainianizing Ukraine. Uh, that the goal is establishing full control over Ukraine rather than sort of affecting its geopolitical orientation. If it was only about its geopolitical orientation and NATO, the Nazi line is not needed, right? It's it's really, um, he would have been emphasizing neutrality, neutrality, neutrality. But instead, he always kind of mentions neutrality as an afterthought, uh, but the main goals are denazification and uh, and recognizing the realities on the ground, et cetera, right? So he repeats it every time because that's the ultimate goal. Again, it's insufficient to control Ukraine's geopolitical orientation. The control yeah, has to be much more multidimensional. And just not to sort of take too much time with this one question, but I think that just to, again, drive really home this point Maria is making, that this denazification is de-Ukrainization. And I think when Putin specifically mentions, like, say, they don't like, you know, Bandera thing, it's not just about Bandera, because they complain about interpretation of the Battle of Konotop whenever it was in 1600 something, right? About Mazepa in 1907, right? Because he's a traitor, there is no other way of looking at it, right? Mentioning, you know, Ukrainian, independent Ukrainian state in the 1917, like, it did not exist, because why did Lenin all of a sudden start, you know, uh, the Koreanization, like, he woke up and started, well, he started Koreanization because they had to fight, you know, Ukrainians, you know, people who were willing to defend Ukrainian state, you know, two years prior. So it is really, like, I think it, there are, you know, many problems with this argument, but it's really the core of it is Ukrainization in any way, shape or form, not just about Bandera and Shuhevich, and, but it's much, much broader than that. Excellent. Well, I have many more questions, but I see that uh, we only have 25 minutes left, so I'll start calling on folks. Uh, Osgur, I think you had your hand up first. Thank you so much for the great presentation and uh, congratulations for the book. Uh, you nice, uh, you challenge and nicely rule out the geopolitical argument uh, in relation to NATO enlargement, saying that Russia's invasion was not a defensive move, uh, rather a reaction to NATO enlargement, but rather a manifestation of uh, changes in geopolitical orientation of both countries uh, driven by domestic political changes and uh, identity shift, uh, in shifts in na national identity. Uh, and accordingly, you use the term imperialization and re-imperialization, uh, perhaps in reference to the historical tendency of Russia's uh, territorial expansionism. I wonder why it manifests this, this uh, imperialization manifested in only in the case of Ukraine and partly in Georgia, but not in Finland or Sweden. Uh, can you expand on this term? Why did you choose re-imperialization? I, I haven't read the book, so maybe uh, it's explained there. I, I don't know. If you can expand on the term a little bit, I, uh, I would appreciate it. And maybe uh, uh, if you can comment on where we should expect this to manifest again, is, is it, it, does it refer to only geographical expansions or that, does it have other dimensions as well? Thank you so much. Yeah, this is a really good question. I mean, I think um, the the idea is you start, so, so re-imperialization means trying to uh, restore uh, the control over the areas that Russia used to control. And 
And I think you always start uh, such a process in a, uh, you start with what's possible, right? Uh, and what's uh, easiest to achieve here. And, and so that's why it starts from, uh, from uh, Ukraine rather than from Finland, because Russia hasn't controlled Finland for, for much longer. It has sort of led, has had the, uh, the length of experience to sort of come to terms with the loss of Finland. Uh, but, uh, but as um, the argument uh, goes, it's sort of, um, you know, the appetite increases as you're eating, right? So, uh, so basically, if Russia manages to reestablish control over Ukraine, we can expect that others will follow because they're the same logic applies you know moldova used to belong to uh the soviet union so it's probably the first candidate for this continued uh re-imperialization but the process of re-imperialization is this idea that russia is entitled to continue controlling uh the areas that it used to control Great. Uh, I will go to a question from the chat. So Steve asks, to what extent does Western perception accurately or inaccurately of Ukrainian-Russian relations matter on the divergence, EU, US, especially the right wing who parrot uh, Putin's talking points? Yeah. Well, maybe I'll start, and Maria would, uh, I'm sure, would add uh, other things. But one thing that sort of immediately jumps to mind is uh, actually two things. So first of all, I mean, there is definitely domestic process on both Russian and Ukrainian side, right? So in other words, I think the agency is important to give and acknowledge that both of these countries have independent agency, and it's not just about sort of the West, you know, meddling, directing, or influencing, so forth, right? Now, that said, because in both countries, the process is contingent, right? In other words, just, you know, follow up on the previous question and answer, how far can Russia goes, what it decides it realistically can and cannot accomplish, is taking place in part, you know, in kind of reference to what is happening in the West. And I think this, um, you know, this Western perception that Russia is still somehow entitled, like it is a great power, that Ukraine is really kind of part of Russian sphere of influence, kind of a certain, you know, take on history that, yes, it was always Russia. Um, you know, all of this plays a role, right? So as Maria was talking, as it, it went a little bit over it in the slide, that this kind of permissive environment, right, that, you, that Russia is getting um, with, with the, you know, response in Syria, with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, we can kind of continue the list. And with this sort of narrative that like, well, we can't really, um, like Russia was humiliated, like how exactly was it humiliated, right? Like we can't um, provoke Russia, right? It has to have an off-ramp, like all of these things, um, I think do serve, it doesn't sort of change the imperialization itself, but I think it affects kind of the calculus, okay, we want to accomplish X, how far can we realistically go, right? I think that's, um, so that does play a role. Great, Sarah? Hi, thank you guys so much for this talk. It's super fascinating, love to hear about this book more and so i guess my question is related to the saliency of identity a lot of conversations i think have happened around like the nationalist identity, identity of both russia and ukraine particularly like, historically based and as like the putin Trump interview that just happened there was a lot of historic historical discussion and i guess i'm wondering there does seem to be a huge like rise as you've shown in ukrainian national identity and national consciousness due to the war and I guess I'm wondering, is that because, is it in direct response to a raise and also like a Russian nationalist narrative that's been, or imperial narrative that's been pushed? Or do you think that this is primarily a war about identity that people aren't talking about? And has that really related to how this has been changing? Especially, I think I'm asking this question because in this space, there is the more shimmer argument, there is the more security argument. And I guess I'm wondering, like, how do you kind of have those, have that conversation with this? A little more directly. Um, the, the the sound is a little muffled. Um, I I think I understood that the part of the question was that oh, how the um how the uh, this identity change in sort of what driving it in Ukraine, right? That was. I, but then where does the Meshimer fit into this? Sorry, I think it was. I'm trying to ask, and sorry, my mic is messed up a bit. Um, if the the conversation the because the Mersheimer argument is more about like security concerns as opposed to identity. 
And so I'm wondering the difference between the saliency and the argument about this is an argument about identity, this is an argument, this is a war about history, as opposed to like, this is a war about security. And I think it was, a lot of people saw Putin as a, because of the Mersheimer argument, it was more of a concern for security as opposed to identity, but with the more, the recent interview and all of that, it seems to, he's also agreeing that it's a war about identity. Yeah, I mean, I think as Maria was, you know, talking about uh, towards the end of the of the talk, the way, you know, we, we, we don't deny that Russia doesn't like NATO, you know, expanding to Ukraine. I mean, that's not, but what, what, what we do emphasize that this was just one of the grievances that they had and not the most important one, right? So that's the thing. So even if you were to take NATO out of the picture altogether, this desire for control of Ukraine would still be there because of this identity conception, which Putin, you know, we can sort of debate to what extent if, say, there was some different leader other than Putin. Putin seems to be, like, really obsessed about history. I think that, you know, the interview is yet another proof to that. Like, I don't know if Tata Carlson is now reading Bogdan Khmelnytsky's letters from 17th century, you know, if he, if he is good for him. But I think this sort of notion, right, and again, as a, somebody who teaches nationalism, I can say, like, he really should have taken a class on series of nationalism, because here we have sort of this constructivist and primordialist view of the nation, right? Like, every nation is constructed. So, yes, Ukrainian is a constructed nation, but so is Russian and German and American and all, all the rest of them. But that's not how he sees it, right? So this sort of almost biological or, or even spiritual, he says the soul is the same. It sort of goes all the way to the soul, Right? And you cannot separate the soul. So, and, and that's why we see these narratives about complaining about Ukrainian attempts to narrate the history differently and to say it wasn't always this like unity and we, we had these periods of conflict and, you know, Ukraine. So, so that's why, you know, in a, in a way, it's not kind of either or, meaning that there was no security concerns on the Russian side or they, they liked NATO. But it's not the main causal, like as, as you know, put on the slide, it's neither necessary nor sufficient. So that's kind of what we are trying to, how we're pushing back against this line of argument. I don't know, Maria, if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, I mean, realism is all about counting, you know, uh, counting weapons and, and capabilities and all of that. And if we looked at, and, and, and also about uh, countries being sort of, having no domestic politics and being, you know, these uh, billiard balls that are, if that is the lens, then obviously uh, it wouldn't make a difference to Russia in terms of threat, whether Ukraine is entering NATO or Finland, because it has a huge border with both. Um, I mean, obviously Finland has fewer people than Ukraine, but Ukraine, on the other hand, was not anywhere close to joining, whereas they let Finland join and they did not object. They, in fact, he, in fact, Putin, in fact, on the record said it's not such a big problem for Russia that Finland is joining. I mean, for a realist lens, um, this really uh, puts a big dent in the argument that he is security driven. The issue of Russia's response to Sweden and Finland joining NATO is actually something that I've been researching, and I think uh, the uh, rhetoric has been changing from the Russian elites, but uh, we'll put that aside. Uh, there's a question from Vadim about whether Ukraine has a vision for Russia in the future, uh, the West's vision for Russia in the 1990s uh, for a democratic uh, westernized country did not uh, work. So what is the best current vision, and is Ukraine a part of that vision? Can Russia and Ukraine coexist peacefully? Yeah, well, I don't want to swear on this, because there is one word that would summarize how Ukrainians want to have a future vision, but I'm going to not use that particular vocabulary. But the, the gist of it is that Ukrainians really would want to be left alone by Russia. I think that's kind of the main, uh, to the extent there is a vision, kind of preferred vision, would be like, do whatever it is that you want to do in your own country, leave us alone, right? So that's kind of, but but then of course, there is also realization that unlike, you know, US that has oceans on both sides, Ukraine does not have the luxury and it is going to have Russia on its border. So some sort of goal, to, that goes to some of these debates that there are at times take place within Ukraine, going sort of to definition of victory, even if Russian forces were expelled to the borders, like, you know, the illegal borders of Ukraine. But the same kind of aggressive imperialist expansionist regime remains in Russia, right? Like the threat is still there. So ideally, of course, Ukraine would like, I think, to have um, 
Russia as a neighbor that would acknowledge its right to be a separate nation and state. It, it doesn't mean that Russia has to like every single thing Ukraine does domestically. But, you know, many countries don't. I mean, I imagine, you know, after, say, take any post-imperial setting, right? Probably the way history of colonial period is taught in India is not the way maybe the British like it, but they're not going to, like, try to go and invade it for that reason, right? So that's sort of the thing that um, at stante at nas, right? Like, here is a polite way of putting it. Um, leave us alone, right? Would that be... So So any kind of talk of cooperation, integration, that's actually gets Ukrainians very angry. I think periodically Russian liberals would say like, well, we're going to have a new Kiev and Rus, but with the center in Kiev and it's going to be some sort of like liberal... Um, Ukrainians don't want, don't want any of that. So that doesn't mean to say you can't have a normal relations. I actually, if that's okay, I'm going to show very quickly because there was one slide we did have... Um, we didn't show that addresses just this very question. Um, where is it? Here it is. Um, in the, uh, oops. yeah. The relationship right? between Russia and Ukraine. The relationship, yeah. You see, so this was when, when people were asked what kind of relationship between Ukraine and Russia should exist. And this question has been asked since the early 1990s, right? And you can see, so for a long time, basically up until 2014, and even then it still becomes kind of like 50-50, that Ukrainians were saying that the relations between Russia and Ukraine should be kind of friendly, right? Not just within any other state. It, it's the question specifically said, do you want to have open borders, no visas, right? Or, or the other option was relations as with any other state. And the third option was unifying into one state. So unifying into so one state clearly, you know, already... Um, even in early 90s is not a majority view. But this notion that there should be some kind of special relationship, right, with open borders, no visas, not just another foreign, like within any other foreign state, is there, right, all the way through the 90s, through the 2000s, until Euromaidan. And even then it becomes kind of like, you know, it's essentially after the first Russian aggression in 2014, um, clearly that turns a lot of Ukrainians, especially have the negative views of the Russian government, but still this perception that maybe we can reconcile and kind of have you know, closer relations than, say, with, I don't know, Hungary, right? But that is completely, then there is a full rupture after 2022. So I think, again, in a way, looking towards the future, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen in multiple generations, but I don't see, um, you know, in the near future, at least, that anything other than just, like, relations with fully independent, fully different states uh, could be conceivable. Fascinating. Thank you for that. Tim, you have your hand up. Thank you, um, everybody. And um, congratulations for the book. And I'm like others, I'm sure looking forward very much to reading it. Um, so two points and one short question. I believe you both somewhat underestimate the view, um, certainly in Moscow, um, in recent years, uh, regarding the um, expansion of NATO, um, you suggested that the idea is that it, your idea is that it wasn't really um, so much of a threat to Russian security. Um, living and working in uh, Moscow, including uh, still at the point when uh, the war started two years ago, um, uh, I, I'm not sure that I would share that view. I believe that. Um, uh, Russia was, uh, and the Russian people and the Russian establishment was very um, concerned uh, about their security. Um, I was working at MGMO, for example, so I was at the very heart of the establishment. So I'm not sure I would I would uh, share that view. I think they were extremely worried. They they would talk about not many other things besides that. Perhaps another common uh, feature was uh, their complaint that uh, they thought they were under the impression that NATO wouldn't expand after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So I think you underestimate slightly the importance of that. My second point is, uh, now I'm British, so um, uh, uh, we are a former imperial power as well. So um, um, perhaps uh, we um, have some uh, shared um, uh, impressions and sensibilities. And I wouldn't underestimate the power um, of um, a people, of a nation, um, which can be easily manipulated by its politicians to romanticize and dream of the past, uh, whether that past ever existed. You only have to look at what happened in my country a few years ago, Brexit, 
um, is a kind of a, a yearning of the British people for an age which may never have even have been, but uh, as may be uh, recorded in some uh, popular fiction, for example. Um, so I, I, I think that that is a, a vulnerability that the Russian people um, have uh, easy is um, when I was working at MGIMO and I was there in 2019, um, everyone was very excited there about Zelensky's election. And uh, they were saying things like, oh, he's a Russian, you know, he's not really a Ukrainian. And they were looking forward very much to his term in office. So where did they go wrong? What was the miscalculation? Thank you very much for listening to me. And again, congratulations. Thanks. I would actually um, say to, I'll, I'll just start very briefly with the with the um, them talking about the security threat coming from NATO. I don't doubt for a second that that was a very uh, often repeated um, repeated narrative. Uh, what what we are trying to say is that their actions don't actually show true concern. Because if you truly are concerned that an invasion of Russia is coming from NATO, you would be fortifying the uh, the border that you have with NATO that's already there. And you would be trying to prevent further expansion to the Nord Nordic countries, which strengthens uh, NATO's capabilities. You wouldn't be focusing on preventing uh, the very unrealistic joining uh, potentially sometime in the future of uh, Ukraine, which is not, which wasn't part of it. So, so I think, uh, I think there is kind of a disconnect between uh, their narrative about it and uh, what actions actually suggest. Um, and in terms of uh what uh went uh why they were so wrong on on Zelensky I mean it's part of um it's part of their conception of um of sort of uh ir irredentist view that someone who is Russian speaking must be therefore pro-Russian and must be taking steps that they're going to like and then when he doesn't do that of course then he immediately becomes a Nazi, right? I mean, I think Osana will add some. Uh, no, I, I totally some, agree. I think that again goes to this sort of like imperial lens of viewing Ukraine and kind of this existential view on the nations more generally, that if you are, like in case of Zelensky, Russian speaker, I mean, he's not ethnically Russian, he's Jewish, right? But okay, like Russian speaker, right? Like, therefore he has to have these views. And I think, unfortunately, to this day, I don't think that has changed because we see this also with the invasion, right? What are they expecting? They travel with parade uniforms. They're expecting the welcome by the Russian-speaking population, right? The whole narrative was that here is this Russian-speaking population, which they claim was like 70% of the population. It wasn't, but okay, whatever, let's say half of the population. And they're being oppressed, right, by this Nazi junta in Kiev. And as soon as the Russian tanks are on the streets, there's going to be greeting of the liberators. Like that doesn't happen. Like it doesn't happen in Russian speaking Kharkiv. It doesn't happen in Russian speaking Kherson. It certainly doesn't happen in Kiev, right? The local elites who are Russian speakers, I mean, look at the current mayors of Kharkiv and Odessa who were kind of like pro-Russian. I mean, not kind of, but quite significantly pro-Russian. Right? There is very limited cooperation, collaboration by the local elites with this. And this goes to show that, you know, yes, you can speak the same language. You could have had shared history in many ways, but then, you know, political reality was different and Ukrainian political nation and sort of reality of coming to think of yourself as Ukrainian. And we actually also see that in the opinion polls. If you say even people who self-identify as Russian, it goes from 22% in the last Soviet census to 17% in 2021 census. Now it's like down to something like 4%. Like where did all these people go? I mean, they re-identified, right? The people who in the Soviet Union, there were all sorts of incentives to identify as a Russian because it led you to career advancement. It was sort of closest to communism. But then, you know, political incentive structure changes once Ukrainian independence is achieved. And the very same people, I mean, I went to school with them, like I know them personally, who now say they're Ukrainian, right? Who at the time, in you know, in the 80s were saying that they're Russian. So, and but I think in the Russian, you know, this is the misperception comes in, like that was just not possible, right? It's either not possible because you have sort of this very rigid kind of existential view 
primordial view of the nation, or, you know, I think in Russian in addition, because you have this kind of imperial view of Ukraine, that they're not really real, like, this is sort of like country bumpkins, they're not the Blizhnia Zarubezhnia, right, near abroad, this is not like real foreign, right, they have to be like, in their heart of hearts, they're really us, but they're not, and the thing we are sort of, and Putin in his latest interview again repeats, there is this, you can't separate the soul, their souls are linked, like, no, they're not, you know, but he's not listening, so... Great. We have uh, one last question in the chat uh, from Stephen. Since economic integration with the West is viewed as an act of aggression by autocratic nations, can you envision NATO or EU type alliances between autocratic governments? And what kind of response do you think this would trigger from the West uh, and its coalition of allies? Um, and perhaps uh, Olsborg. Sure. Yeah. I'm sorry, Maria. Let's have Osgur ask the final question because we just have a couple of minutes left. My question is very related to that question, actually. Uh, at this recent interview, Putin at some point mentioned about his proposal to, I guess it was Bill Clinton, uh, that Russia should be accepted to NATO as well, included in NATO as well. And uh, he talked about his reaction. Uh, to what extent do you think uh, domestic politics and changes in na national identity what, what can be isolated from international relations or a country's foreign relations? In uh, Put differently, do you think uh, there were, were there several, some opportunities to bring Russia into the Western fold a little bit? Or would it, if uh, there these opportunities were used to integrate Russia economically, politically uh, to the Western fold. Would that uh, affect the national identity and then domestic politics in a different direction? And then probably we may not see this outcome uh, today. Yeah, Thank you. I mean, the, the historical record is that uh, the West really did try to bring out all sorts of uh, opportunities for cooperation. And in fact, kind of um, put a lot of benefit of the doubt and, and, and sort of um, even as um, Russia was sliding back into authoritarianism, there was still a lot of deference to a lot of hope that you know good relations can continue and a lot of deference to Russia um, as it behaved in the region uh, in uh, in the 90s. So we had sort of the the West really you know uh, not let Russia wage its wars in in Chechnya because that was within Russia itself but also, kind of not respond uh, strongly to the interferences, um, backing up separatists in, in the Caucasus, in Moldova, etc. So um, the opportunity uh, to, um, and, and also, of course, when the first NATO expansion happened, this is when uh, the Russia NATO Founding Act was also put in place. So there was, this was closely negotiated with Russia and closely, um, uh, closely discussed. I mean, the reason Russia could not enter NATO is not because the West didn't want to integrate it, it's because Russia would not uh, didn't want to be just one member of a big alliance. It saw um, Europe as uh, the U.S.'s vassals, so it wanted something, um, some special status within NATO that's going to be sort of equivalent to what they perceive to be a special status of the uh, U.S. in the alliance. So, so it was uh, it's disingenuous for, for Putin to claim that somehow Russia wanted to be part of NATO but wasn't uh, let in. There were all sorts of opportunities explored, but Russia was not willing to have either the transparency that being in NATO requires with all the allies or the regular NATO member status that, that would kind of, in their view, bring them down a notch uh, geopolitically.
Oksana, final word from you? I know. I, I think Maria nailed it. <laughs> the Wonderful. answer. Well, thank you so much for such a thought-provoking and enlightening uh, conversation. And thank you to the audience for, for such engaging questions. This was uh, such a pleasure. Congratulations to you both once again on uh, an excellent book. And everyone, please join me in a round of applause for our two distinguished guest speakers. Thank you. Thank Thank you you all. very much for tuning in and for the great questions. Yes, thanks for great questions. Thanks for enlightening us.